Welcome back to another episode of the CSK8 podcast. My name is Jared O'Leary. Each week alternates between an interview with a guest or a solo episode where I unpack some scholarship. In this particular episode, I am unpacking the paper titled Nonverbal Overload, colon, The Theoretical Argument for the Causes of Zoom Fatigue. This was written by Jeremy N. Balenson. Now, this particular paper is available for free, and you can find a direct link to it in the show notes, which you can find by clicking the link in the description or the app that you're listening to this on or by simply going to jaredoleary.com. When you click on the article title for this particular paper, it'll take you directly to the paper. And if you click on the author's last name, it'll take you to their Google Scholar profile so you can check out more publications by this particular author. All right, so here's the abstract for this particular paper. Quote, for decades, scholars have predicted that video conference technology will disrupt the practice of commuting daily to and from work and will change the way people socialize. In 2020, the COVID-19 pandemic forced a drastic increase in the number of video conference meetings, and Zoom became the leading software package because it was free, robust, and easy to use. While the software has been an essential tool for productivity, learning, and social interaction, something about being on video conference all day seems particularly exhausting, and the term Zoom fatigue caught on quickly. In this article, I focus on nonverbal overload as a potential cause for fatigue and provide four arguments outlining how various aspects of the current Zoom interface likely led to psychological consequences. The arguments are based on academic theory and research, but also have yet to be directly tested in the context of Zoom and require future experimentation to confirm. Instead of indicting the medium, My goal is to point out these design flaws to isolate research areas for social scientists and to suggest design improvements for technologists, end quote. All right, so if I were to summarize this particular paper, I would say that this paper describes four potential causes for Zoom fatigue. Now, one thing I wanna point out in the abstract is this is not a study. This is not empirical research. This is written by somebody who has done empirical research and quite frankly, has done a lot of research in publications. The way I read this particular paper is this author is basically saying, hey, we are collectively, as a society, creating a term called Zoom fatigue. And the author is trying to figure out, well, what might be causing that so-called Zoom fatigue? And what can we do about it? So they are going to highlight some prior research and prior theories that might be related and talk about it in relation to video conferencing, specifically through Zoom as a platform. Now, while I read some of the main summaries of this particular paper, I'm going to talk about, okay, so if this is a thing, which it may or may not be, what can we as CS educators do about this if we are doing remote teaching and learning? All right, so there's a short intro and basically the intro is saying that, hey, we don't really have a lot of studies that are looking at spending multiple hours a day on a particular medium through video conferencing. And so this paper is going to highlight some theoretical explanations based on prior work that might explain why people are feeling fatigued when engaging in Zoom or other video conferencing platforms for several hours a day. All right, so the first section is called I gaze at a close distance. All right, so here's a quote from PDF page two. Quote, on Zoom, behavior ordinarily reserved for close relationships, such as long stretches of direct eye contact and faces seen close up, has suddenly become the way we interact with casual acquaintances, coworkers, and even strangers. There are two separate components to unpack here, the size of faces on the screen and the amount of time the viewer is seeing the front on view of another person's face, which simulates eye contact, end quote. So the point that the author is making is that when you're engaging in a, like the Brady Bunch style conversation where you have a bunch of different squares where everybody is all looking into their cameras or looking at their screen, which might have their camera right above or below or to the side of it. This makes it so that it looks like everybody is staring at you all the time when in actuality, they're probably looking at their screen, maybe looking at their email or just zoning out, whatever. Now the author points out that if we were engaging in a meeting, let's say with like 20 people, arbitrary number, at any given moment, not everybody is going to be staring at the person who is actually speaking. People might be looking off to the side, people might be looking at the notes that they're taking on a notepad, people might be looking at a device that they're typing into, or they might just be looking away from the person who's speaking, but still actively listening. So when engaging with a conversation one-on-one or in in group settings, there is significantly less eye gaze as people aren't always staring at you while you are speaking or when you are speaking to somebody else. Now, another thing in this section that the author points out is depending on the size of the monitor that you are using, it's going to change how large the face is of the person that is on the other end of the video conference platform. 
So if you're in a group with one person, it might look like they are like sitting right in front of you if you have a large monitor, like really close to you. If you are communicating with somebody who is in a group call and there's like, let's say 50 people on it and you see 50 different squares, different tiles, and you have a small monitor, they're going to appear very small and very far away. And the author is arguing that if the person appears really close to you, this kind of comes across as a, a more intimate personal distance that is typically reserved for close family members and friends, etc. Here's a quote from pages two and three of the PDF. Quote, but with Zoom, all people get the front on views of all other people nonstop. This is similar to being in a crowded subway car while being forced to stare at the person you are standing very close to instead of looking down or at your phone. On top of this, it is as if everyone in the subway car rotated their bodies such that their faces were oriented toward your eyes, end quote. Okay, so what can we as CS educators do about this? So one thing is we might be able to change the angle of the camera that we are using. So for example, if you watch a lot of like Twitch streamers or video game streamers, they will often have their camera off to an angle, off to the side, and sometimes they'll have a monitor over there. So while they're gaming, they will look straight on at the game that they are playing. And then when they want to communicate directly to their chat or the people who are watching, they will physically turn their head, look at the other monitor or the camera, and then will speak directly into the camera there. So this makes it so they are not staring directly at their audience the entire time, but instead are looking at their screen. And then when they want to look over and, and give that impression of the direct eye contact, they will physically turn their head and look at their camera. So if you have an external camera, this is one thing that you could potentially do to make it so that you're not having it appear as though you are staring at somebody the entire time. You can be more intentional with when you are, in fact, trying to give direct eye contact. Now, if you don't have an external camera, but you do have an external monitor, you can flip that. So you can have it so that you are looking at your external monitor, which might be off to the side, and then turn your head to look at your like lap laptop that might have a, a built-in camera to give that direct eye contact when you want to. Now, when it comes to the, the, the size of people who you are meeting with, you can minimize your window or at least make it smaller and make it so that they don't appear really large on the screen. So I like to, when I'm engaging in one-on-one -on -one conversations, make it so that the person is very small and I move that window right to the top of my, my monitor and put it right underneath where my camera is at. So when I'm looking at my screens, I will be looking at the different windows and like typing different stuff in. And when I wanna look directly at somebody, I will look up at their small box of where they are at and that happens to be right below my camera. So it gives the impression that I'm now providing direct eye contact when I am actually looking at their little video square instead of looking at one of the open windows on my screen. Another thing regarding eye gaze, by the way, that the author didn't really mention, I also block the blue light that comes out of my monitors because I am working on my computer pretty much all day long. And so I will enable the night light mode and set that to the maximum setting, which gives this like orangish tint to my screen. And honestly, it makes it so that my eyes aren't as exhausted while looking at a screen all day long. This does mess with the coloring of things. So if I'm working on something that requires me to look at the coloring of the screen, then I will just turn it off temporarily, watch it or engage with whatever it is that I'm doing. And then I will turn it back on because it does help me. You can also get eyeglasses if that's something of interest to you. Just make sure you actually look online to make sure that it does what it's supposed to do. And it's not just a hunk of plastic that you might be paying a lot of money for. All right, so that's the eye gaze at a close distance discussion. So the next section in this paper is titled Cognitive Load. So the basic gist of it can be summarized in this particular sentence. That's on page three of the PDF. Quote, on Zoom, nonverbal behavior remains complex, but users need to work harder to send and receive signals, end quote. So there are a lot of nonverbal things that we need to consider when engaging in video conferencing, like engaging in Zoom. So the author mentions like centering oneself in the center of the camera's view, nodding in an exaggerated way to make it clear that people can see that you agree or disagree or whatever, looking directly into the camera and trying to make some eye contact when speaking. In addition, the author cites a study that found that people speak 15% louder, 1-5% louder when interacting on video. And then if you're doing this all day long, this can be even just straining on your voice. So in addition to sending some nonverbal cues, the author also mentions that we have to work harder when receiving nonverbal cues from video conferencing platforms. Here's a quote from page three. Quote, for example, in a face-to-face -face meeting, a quick sidelong glance where one person darts their eyes to another has a social meaning. And a third person watching this exchange likely encode this meaning. 
In Zoom, a user might see a pattern in which on the grid it seems like one person glanced at another. However, that is not what actually happened, since people often don't have the same grids. Even if the grids were kept constant, it is far more likely the glancing person just got a calendar reminder on their screen or a chat message. Users are constantly receiving nonverbal cues that would have a specific meaning in a face-to-face -face context, but have different meanings on Zoom, end quote. So in other words, somebody might be responding to something that has nothing to do with what you or somebody else is saying. They might be looking at something else. They might be browsing TikTok or looking on YouTube or responding to somebody else that's in the room that you can't see who's off camera, etc. Because we are missing that context, we are engaging in a higher amount of cognitive load because we're trying to like fill in those gaps and figure out, well, why did they just give that nonverbal signal? In addition, because Zoom tends to focus on upper body nonverbal cues, so like for example, you don't necessarily see a person standing or sitting entirely. All we see is from like the chest up. This makes it so that we are missing some cues related to body posture or whether or not their legs are crossed or uncrossed, whether or not somebody is slouching, etc. So we're focusing all this attention on upper body nonverbal cues and are unable to see some of the other nonverbal cues that we would normally see in person or might see. Okay, so as CS educators, what can we do about this? So one thing that we might be able to do is just be aware that some of our nonverbal cues might be coming across in ways that are unintended. So maybe posting in the chat while somebody else is talking, hey, I really uh, agreed with that comment that Susie just made just to make it clear who your nonverbal signals are directed at. So the next section of this paper is titled An All-Day Mirror. And here's a quote from page four of the PDF. Quote, Imagine in the physical workspace, for the entirety of an eight-hour day, an assistant followed you around with a handheld mirror. And for every single task you did and every conversation you had, they made sure you could see your own face in that mirror. This sounds ridiculous, but in essence, this is what happens on Zoom calls. Even though one can change the settings to hide self-view, the default is that we see our own real-time camera feed and we stare at ourselves throughout hours of meetings per day." End quote. Now the author mentions that there's been studies going on for decades about what happens when people look at themselves in the mirror, and they tend to be more evaluative of seeing themselves in the mirror. So while this can lead to better social behaviors, this can also be stressful for some people. So for example, the author mentions that there's a study that found that this self-focus might actually, quote, prime women to experience depression, end quote, from page four. So this is something that we need to be aware of. So one of the things that we might need to do when working with students or colleagues is to simply demonstrate and explain how you can turn off this self-view for people who want to turn it off. Now, I will say that I actually prefer to keep mine on. I'm aware that you're able to turn it off and I intentionally turn it on because my nonverbal cues tend to look upset when I'm just thinking, likely from all my years on drumline where we were told to not smile. But because I'm better able to see that now, I'm able to recognize, oh, my nonverbal cues come across in a way that I don't intend, and I'm able to course correct with that. Or explain, hey, I'm just thinking right now. I promise I'm not mad at you. So for me, this has actually been beneficial, but for some people, it might be detrimental. So something that we should be aware of. And honestly, is a pretty easy fix. Just right-clicking and then click the option to hide the self-view. All right, so the last section of this paper is titled Reduced Mobility. So here's a quote from PDF page four. Quote, even in situations where one is not tied to the keyboard, the cultural norms are to stay centered within the camera's view frustrum and to keep one's face large enough for others to see. In essence, users are stuck in a very small physical cone, and most of the time, this equates to sitting down and staring straight ahead. During face-to-face -face meetings, people move. They pace, stand up, and stretch, doodle on a notepad, get up to use a chalkboard, even walk over to the water cooler to refill their glass." End quote. So the author says that one of the things that we can do is simply turn off the camera or simply go to a phone call when able to, as this can make it so you can be more mobile. Something that I would also like to add is I am frequently found in meetings walking on a treadmill. So I built a treadmill desk where I basically took a TV stand, mounted it above my treadmill, made it so that I could set my laptop on the arms of the treadmill, by using a long drum pad, and then connect that to a monitor that I put on top of the TV stand that's mounted on the wall. And that makes it so that I can walk during meetings. This is really helpful for me. Some of the things that I've also done is I have turned off my camera and will be like on my rowing machine or on an exercise bike or simply on the ground stretching while in a meeting. This makes it so that I'm able to be much more mobile and move around. But another thing that I like to do, at least when I'm hosting meetings, is do the Pomodoro method 
using 50-10 approach. So we might work for 50 minutes and then take a 10 minute break. And in that 10 minute break, you can do whatever you want. Get up, move around, stretch, do jumping jacks, hands, hands, whatever. And then we come back and continue for another 50 minutes, 5-0, and then take another 10 minute break. This is how I tend to work throughout the day. So if I'm not on the treadmill desk and I'm working on my desktop, I will work for 50 minutes and then I'll take a 10 minute break where I walk on the treadmill and read a book or listen to a podcast or even drum on the pad that is resting on top of the treadmill. So this has been really helpful for me in terms of getting me moving throughout the day and I highly recommend it for anyone else interested in increasing their mobility while engaging in a lot of video conferencing. All right, so those are the four main areas in this particular article. Again, this is not an empirical article based on a research study, but it is still very valuable to think about how prior research and frameworks might inform this feeling of Zoom fatigue. It might help us better understand what we can do to make it a little bit better working remotely or teaching remotely. All right, so normally I would end these episodes sharing some of my own lingering thoughts and questions. But for this one, I'm going to end with a question of what other strategies do you have for decreasing Zoom fatigue? If you have some other strategies that you highly recommend for others to consider, please consider sharing them on Twitter, on Facebook, wherever, email, carrier pigeon. So for example, you can use hashtags on Twitter, such as hashtag CSK8, and include a link to this paper or this podcast that kind of unpacks potential causes of Zoom fatigue. If you would like some resources that are related to remote learning, please check out the resources section in the show notes. I'll include some links in there. And please consider sharing this with somebody who might benefit from hearing this particular episode. And with that, that concludes this week's episode of the CSK8 podcast. I hope you're all staying safe and are having a wonderful week. Thank you so much for listening.